Uh, all right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's it's good to be home, back uh, here at Fifth Avenue Chapel. And uh, I, I was going to jump right into the message, but of course, Phil ruined that for me and said, "Oh, update." Um, I'll ju I'll just be very brief. Uh, Things are going as well as they could be in Connecticut. I uh, saw a couple bears and bobcats and things like that, so a little scary. But um, other than that, we finally got plugged into uh, a local church there and we're enjoying ourselves. We've been getting together with a lot of uh, people from the area and just getting to know everyone. And it's just been uh, kind of busy with that, but also enjoyable uh, as we just you know, try to reach out to, uh, you know, the people in Connecticut where we're living right now and getting to know them uh, so that we can continue to grow. And, uh, you know, Melinda has been doing, uh, supporting us financially with her job, which I'm thankful for, uh, has given me the opportunity to, to work on my dissertation, uh, which my, my aim is a, a year, but uh, it's like the more you get into it, the the more you realize like, yeah, maybe this won't happen uh, in the next year, but we'll see. Uh, I've been working on that and then just different opportunities to minister as well. Uh, and so that's kind of what I've been up to. And uh, there's one opportunity that I have that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Uh, so, cause I have been looking for uh, work, but being very specific as just not taking anything because we weren't in that financial constraint because, uh, you know, Melinda was willing um, to take on a job. So that, which I'm thankful for, but having this one opportunity that we're kind of just, you know, praying about and seeing if the Lord opens up that door. Uh, I, I don't want to say anything because then if it doesn't work out, but hopefully by the next time I'm back here, which is June, uh, I could actually present to you on what that ministry would look like and, and what it would be. But that's kind of where we're at. Uh, the kids have adjusted well. Uh, I'm just so thankful how the Lord has built them to, to transition so well, uh, you know, and we just had, you know, just to see Annabelle and Asher and even Aiden now, you know, of all like, like just, man, they're, they're kind of flourishing and the Lord, uh, the Lord is using them and we're, we're thankful for that. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of just an update of where we're at. If you have more questions, I, I don't like talking about that stuff, but if you have more questions, uh, feel free uh, to ask me. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. Uh, I've had the opportunity, uh, you have to love technology because now I've had the opportunity to kind of follow along in the series. And uh, uh, it's, been, it's been fun kind of going through the book of Acts and uh and following along with you all and i'm excited uh, i i did prepare for the whole chapter and then jim reminded me he's like oh you don't have to do the last uh you know five verses uh and so i'm not going to take away from next week but i might just mention a, a little bit uh about the the conflict that we have there between uh paul and barnabas but we're going to kind of work through uh, uh the jerusalem uh council to, to say the room was tense would be a massive understatement. It was eight years before the death of the church, but few in that room would have predicted the church's demise. The church had bounced back a bit during the past year, since most of the members would not allow any contemporary elements in the very staid and traditional service at 11 a.m., some younger adults started their own contemporary service at 8.30. Bible study classes fit between the two services. Of course, the 8.30 service was really not that contemporary by modern standards, an acoustic, an acoustic guitar, some contemporary songs along with the more traditional hymns, a keyboard instead of the organ, but it was really more blended than anything. The new service did provide the first growth in the church in two decades. The previous year attendance had dipped from 75 to 62, but the new service added 30 people in average attendance. So the church was at a five year high of 92 in worship attendance. As the younger adults invited friends to the first service, they kept hearing the same refrain. 
We like the service, but it would be better for us and our children if the service was later. The solution seems simple. Move the traditional service to 8.30 and the contemporary service to 11. Wrong. The change required a church vote. At least that's what some of the members said. No one could find any confirmation. So, so it was time for the meeting. It was time for the business session from Hades. There were about 150 people present. That included members who had not been to church in five years or more. That included people most others did not know. It was obvious what was taking place. Members had recruited others to come to the meeting to vote not to change. The exchange of words was harsh. Accusations were made. Guitars were declared to be of the devil. One member declared he would let the church die before that change was made. He would get his way eight years later. The vote was not close. Nothing changed. Well, that's not exactly true. The first service ceased five weeks later. Attendance dropped to 43 by the end of the year. And less than eight years later, the church closed its doors. That's an excerpt from uh, a book, Autopsy of a Deceased Church by Tom Rayner. And uh, he, he gives multiple examples of how churches have failed to handle conflict. And so we can see how, how conflict can hinder the growth of the gospel. And it's clear that we need to be aware of how to handle conflict so that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what we get in Acts chapter 15. There was an issue. <laughs> Gentiles were believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were getting saved. But did they have to be circumcised? In other words, did they have to identify as being a Jew? Did they have to come under the Mosaic law? And that's exactly what we read about in Acts chapter 15. So let's read through uh, Acts chapter 15, and we're just going to read uh, to verse uh, 35. So Acts 15, 1 through 35. Verse 1, reading from the ESV, it says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witnesses to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly felt silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. <coughs> After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. 
Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabas and Silas leading men among the brothers. With the following letter, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by, the, by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for your word. Just pray that the preaching would not be done with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we said, we see that conflict can hinder the growth of the gospel. And here we are in, in Acts chapter 15. Paul and Barnabas complete their first missionary journey, which we went through last week, and it, it began the, the expansion of the gospel. Thank you. It began the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles. And if we go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that's kind of how, how Luke has outlined uh, the book of Acts, right? That it would be Jerusalem, uh, Judea, Samaria, and then to uh, the ends of the earth. And so here we are kind of seeing the gospel being expanded uh, to the Gentiles. They come back to Antioch. They report to the church what God had done on their journey. And that's what's going to set the stage for the conflict that some men are going to come down from Judea around Jerusalem and saying, hey, you can't be, you have to be circumcised. And so that's, when we, when we look at it from that perspective, we see that there was a transitioning happening and now conflict. It's interesting that the Jerusalem council is at uh, the, the center of acts structurally and theologically, I, you know, I, I would say, but structurally based on word count. Now I didn't count every word uh, and you do have Bible software that you can probably go and, and verify that, verify this, but it seems that the word count for Acts 1 through 14 is 12,385. The word count for Acts 15 through 28 is 12,502, right? So we kind of see that this is right in the center of the book of Acts structurally. And there's also a shift from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And it's interesting that Peter is no longer mentioned after the Jerusalem council. So we don't see uh, we don't see Peter. Uh, the church in Jerusalem plays a background until Paul goes back to Jerusalem in, in Acts chapter 21. So that's structurally, but also theologically, right? The Gentiles are receiving the same Holy Spirit as the Jews. What does that mean? What, do, do they, must they become Jews and follow the Mosaic law? If they're, if they're, they're getting saved and they're receiving the same Holy Spirit, well, don't they have to get circumcised? Don't they have to enter into to God's covenantal promises? And so that's kind of the issue we, we have here from a theological standpoint. Something else that we just need to address is that is the Jerusalem Council the same meeting 
as Galatians 2, 1 through 14. So if you're unfamiliar with Galatians chapter 2, right, the book of Galatians, Paul, Paul's writing to them to basically defend the gospel that he proclaimed to them, because some were coming in and saying, hey, you must be circumcised. And in Galatians chapter 5, he actually says, uh, if, if you have to be circumcised, Christ is of no advantage to you, right? And so he kind of makes that bold statement there. And so we see that he's, he's fighting against what he would identify as false teachers and what were false teachers and saying, hey, no, it's, we're justified by faith, Galatians chapter two. Well, in Galatians chapter two, there's, Paul says, I went to the, to the pillars, as he would call them. I went to the apostles. I talked to them and they said, the gospel that I'm proclaiming to the Gentiles, to you, is true. And so we say, well, hmm, there's a lot of similarities there between Acts 15 and Galatians chapter 2. Now, some would say it is the same meeting. Luke just recorded it differently. I wouldn't have an issue with that. I, I don't expect Luke's recording of something to look identical to Paul's, Paul's recording. And so I, I wouldn't have an issue if that was the case. But it seems that there are some differences Peter was rebuked by Paul in Galatians chapter two after his meeting with the apostles and the elders, right? So it, it, would, it would seem interesting to think, well, why didn't Luke record that? And we can go into many different details, but it seems that it's two different meetings. And I would say that this probably, the meeting that Paul had in Galatians was probably back in maybe Acts chapter 11, at the end of Acts chapter 11, where he was going to Jerusalem to bring uh, relief for the famine right? And he had that interaction with them there. Uh, that, that's what I would say. But I, so again, if you want to spend time studying, I think it's important to mention because some look and say, well, hey, look, these are two different accounts, right? It's not that they're, uh, or that uh, they're contradicting each other because it's supposed, it's supposedly the same meeting, uh, you know, so you can spend time in there, but I would say that they're two different accounts. The first one in Galatians probably happened, happened, more in Acts chapter 11, at the end, verse 30, when Paul comes with the famine relief. And then, of course, we have the official Jerusalem council in Acts 15 here. Acts 15 is also a typical pattern we see throughout the book of Acts, right, that Luke recorded when we're looking at the progress of Christianity. And this is very important because uh, we have to understand that the book of Acts is um, descriptive, not prescriptive, right? Meaning that Luke is just describing for us what has happened. It's kind of like a historical narrative. Hey, this is what happened. And then he ties in theological implications based on that history and what the church went through. And I say that because I, I'm tempted to be like, hey, this is how we handle conflict. Look at Acts chapter 15. Well, we also have to look at other portions of scripture where um, Paul was dealing that. For example, uh, yes, there was debate and dissension among the brethren, among the brethren there, but, uh, you know, we also read where Paul says, hey, you, you who are spiritual should go and with gentleness correct people, right? So it's not just like, ah, yeah. Um, it, it, so we have to be careful of that. And so uh, when we're looking at that, but this is a typical pattern. An example of this is Acts chapter six, where we have the Hellenist widows who are neglected in the daily distribution, right? We see that there was a, there was a conflict, a problem in the early church. The steps were taken to deal with it. And then what happens? We see notable advances that take place of the gospel. And Acts 15 uh, is no different uh, from that. So let's kind of work through uh, the, these verses here. We have uh, verses one through six. And I, I kind of looked at this and I said, the, the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles needed spirit-filled leaders. And as I kind of look at this, I see, but some men came down uh, from Judea. So they weren't in a position of authority. They were just some men. Now, they could have been claiming authority, but Luke doesn't identify them uh, as, as, as having authority. Now, were they, were they believers? Uh, I, according to Luke, it looks like they were, because uh, maybe they're not talking about the same men in verse 1 and verse 5. But it says, but some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep uh, the law of Moses. So it seems like they're believers. And they're, with that said, they were, they're wrong. And we, we read that, right, that they had wrong conclusions. But 
it, just because somebody's wrong doesn't mean that there's not a, a heart that wants to see people following after the Lord, right? And so that's kind of setting the, the stage for us in conflict that even as we saw in our example of contemporary music versus not contemporary music and what time the services should be and this, and it's, it's almost like when we see people wanting to see change, we're automatically assumed that they're divisive and they're trying to de destroy the church in some way instead of saying, well, no, hold on, maybe they have a genuineness that they just want to see the gospel go forth. They want to see people bring honor and glory uh, uh, to the Lord. What's the issue? Well, circumcision, right? That, that's the issue. But better yet, it's probably dealing with obedience to the Mosaic law because the, the Gentiles, they're not circumcised, but more importantly, they're probably, they're, they're thought of as pagans, right? And the, the things that they would do, and we'll kind of see that later on uh, it, in the chapter where James encourages them to, for example, sexual immorality, right? Well, because in the pagan world, it's part of the worship of the gods. <laughs> so, you, you know, we, we see that, like, that's why we have this issue. But um, so it's kind of this obedience to the Mosaic law. What is required for to have true faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul and Barnabas disagree with them. Uh, we don't see a defense yet, um, but it's, it's interesting to me in, in this context, right? Because if we're talking about the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles needed spirit-filled leaders, I, I'm thinking, I, I think through the life of the apostle Paul. If you go and you read Galatians chapter one, right? Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. It's like his authority did not come from Acts chapter 13. It came from the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet we see a, a willing submission to the leaders in the local church. Because Paul's disagreeing with them. Paul and Barnabas are disagreeing with these men. And it says that, some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders. So they were appointed by the church in Antioch, go to the leadership in Jerusalem and resolve this matter. And, but yet this is the apostle Paul. And I just appreciate that as an example, right? That, that Paul exemplifies that for us. Um, we, we also see that in, in these verses that there's a clear distinction between the meeting with the church because Paul Paul passes through Phoenicia, Samaria, um, and he's describing in detail all the conversion of the Gentiles, and it, it brought great joy to the brothers. And then when they come to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. So they get there first, and they kind of sit down with the church as a whole, kind of like we're gathered together, right? Some men hear what Paul and Barnabas are saying, and they're like, well, hold on. You have to be circumcised. And then what we see in verse six is that the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And it, it I guess I would have to say, you just have to trust me on this, but you can, you can research it. It's a different meeting, right? The way Luke writes it, like he separates when Paul and Barnabas are with the church. So the whole church isn't involved in the discussion. It's the apostles and the elders, right? And so that's why when I'm, when I'm reading this, I'm seeing, man, when it comes to conflict, when it comes to the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles, there was spirit-filled leaders. And it's interesting that in Acts chapter 15, if we say, let's compare it to Acts chapter 6, what was, what was only in Acts chapter 6? What was only the apostles? Now, in Acts chapter 15, there's the apostles and the elders, and that's why we have like Ephesians 2, 19 through 20, where it says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So we see that the apostles were playing a role as the church, the church being built upon them. But as it was expanding, they were appointing leadership within the context of, of the local church. And so we see this progression of the church and that the Holy Spirit was appointing elders. And it's, if you go to Acts chapter 20, 
which some, you know, we'll, we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, uh, you go to Acts chapter 20 and you see that they're appointed by the Holy Spirit, right? And I think, I think Luke brings that truth out. So when we're dealing with conflict, we have to respect those whom the Holy Spirit has appointed as leaders. And uh, I'll just share like kind of like a quick testimony side of things. And maybe some of you know this, uh, but I'll, I'll never forget when we, when I first wanted to go to the mission field, I was probably like the most rebellious, you know, individual meeting with leadership in the church about wanting to go to the mission. You know, you think, oh, he wants to be a missionary. Therefore, he's going to submit to the leadership and he's a good guy. And, you know, like I was probably like the complete opposite side of the spectrum where any guidance I was getting from the leadership, I was pushing back because I just wanted to go, <laughs> right? And I'll never forget when um, Asher was in the hospital, uh, Melinda was with him, I came to prayer meeting, somebody was speaking on Hebrews chapter 13, verses one through eight. And you know, when you're in those moods, sometimes you just keep reading, you're not even listening to the guy speaking, hopefully you're not doing that now. Um, but, uh, you know, I just kept reading and I came to like, uh, and Jim probably can testify to this. We've had conversations. I'm like, Jim, why do I have to listen to them? Like, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to leave. And I came to the verse in verse 17 in Hebrews chapter 13, where it says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. I think I, I thought to myself, man, I bet you they groan every time they see my name on that agenda, you know, and uh, it, it says for that would be of no advantage to you. And the Lord convicted me like, just submit, listen. And it was through that where it's like, hey, we paid off a lot of debt that we had, right? It's through that, like the Lord, you know, was working in me and, and, and Melinda and we grew together, right? And so I, it, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see how our culture has influenced Christianity, right? With the idea that, well, I can watch any service I want. I don't have to be a member of a church. And it was something Melinda and I were struggling with when we moved uh, to Connecticut. We were there for, you know, four months. And finally, like I said, Melinda, I'm just, I'm done with this. I need to be in a church where I'm participating, um, I'm involved and I'm submitting to leadership. And it's been very humbling for me to be in that situation because I was a missionary, right? And so it's kind of like you want to, oh, maybe we should do things this way. And the Lord has really humbled me in that, in the sense of submitting to leadership. And it's clear here that when we're trying to resolve conflict, we need to trust that, hey, the Lord has appointed these men to lead us and to guide us. And it's not a submission of like, we're going to do what you say, you're the best. It's that, hey, this is, the Lord has given them that responsibility. And so we see that right here within the, the Jerusalem Council. So I would say that the expansion of the gospel, because that, that's ultimately our goal as the local church, right? We're to expand the glory of God and, and preach the gospel here and then to, through the ends of the earth. So uh, as we're looking at that, we need to recognize that, the God, that God uses spirit-filled leaders to expand the gospel, just as uh, the situation that happened in Acts. Now, as we go down to verses 7 through 11, we see that the expansion of the gospel needs a spirit-filled testimony, right? And we see Peter's response supporting the expansion of the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. And th this is interesting because, remember, if you go back to Acts chapter 10, Peter was kind of like torn, like, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean, but yet here you are telling me to go to Cornelius. Ah, I just, you know, and he, he was struggling, but no, he goes to Cornelius. He proclaims the gospel to him. And what does he see? He sees the Holy Spirit fill Cornelius and he sees signs and wonders among the Gentiles. And he's like, wow, the gospel is coming uh, to, to the Gentiles. And so Peter kind of stands up and, and gives this testimony and he makes his first point uh, in uh, verse, verse seven, he says that, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by the mouth of Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. 
and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So Peter's first point is that there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. The same Holy Spirit that came upon us, right? Because some of these apostles were there in the upper room. They saw Peter, you know, James probably saw Peter proclaiming this message. And they're, they're saying like, hey, the same Holy Spirit that, that came upon us came upon the Gentiles. We both are equally received. And you think of, of Paul in Ephesians chapter two, right? Where it says that Christ came in. And I mean, if you really read through the book of Ephesians, you'll, you just see the theme of, of oneness and unity. The church was, was struggling over this matter. And, and Paul is, he comes in and he says, listen, the Lord Jesus Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition. There, there is no longer these, these separate courts. He's, he's broken that down. You, the Jew can come to the father. The Gentile can come to the father. And matter of fact, he has made peace with both of you, you both have peace now together as you both approach the throne. And so there's, there's no distinction. That's, that's Peter's first argument. And he's, he doesn't, if you notice, he doesn't use scripture. He's not quoting a scripture to say, see, there's no distinction between us, just as I did. I'm just saying that other parts of scripture support this, support this thought. And, but Peter's testimony is simple. He's like, I've seen what the Holy Spirit has done in the life of of the, the Gentile. They, I have received it. They have received it. There's no longer a distinction. Peter's second point, why test God? <laughs> now, therefore, verse 10, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? <laughs> why test God? If they're receiving the Holy Spirit. We've received the Holy Spirit. We're seeing signs and wonders among the Gentiles. We're seeing signs and wonders among the Jews. Why are we testing God by adding requirements to this, imposing something that the Lord himself did not impose? Right? And if we go back to, this is kind of a tough question. And I, I gave this as a discussion question because it is like, what does, what does he mean by placing a yoke on the neck? of the disciples, like the, the law placing a yoke. And, I, and I, I have my own kind of opinions on that, but I will just say that when you read like Galatians uh, chapter three, verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And I think what, what Peter is saying is that like th the law can be burdensome, right? Like it can, it, can, it can weigh us down and they're Gentiles. And if we as Jews were burdened by, like it was a burden for us at times, can you imagine what we're gonna do to the Gentiles? So why place this yoke upon them if the Lord himself did not do it, right? Because he has seen them doing signs and wonders and being filled with the Holy Spirit. So why are we adding these requirements? Why are we imposing something? And then finally, Peter gives his confessional statement, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. He brings the focus back to Christ, right? So we see that, that the expansion of the gospel to the nations is by the grace of God, not by the Mosaic law. So we see a shift from the Mosaic law to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came, he said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, right? The law pointed to him. And now we are under the law of Christ as Paul would identify it in, in Galatians. So Peter did not believe in adding these requirements for salvation. And again, it's interesting that this is just a simple testimony. He doesn't get in too deep. He's just like, I, I have seen God working, you know, and he was encouraged by that. And, you know, uh, especially I'll, I'll speak for myself here is that I, my, the students back in Jamaica, one of the first things they used to, sometimes they would just walk by me and they say, Mike, give me a verse, give me a verse. Because whenever they would say anything, that would be like, well, where do you see that in scripture? Like, can you support that please? You know, I was like, well, I was just encouraged. No, no, you need to support it by scripture. <laughs> um, and instead of just saying, wow, like this student had a heartfelt testimony, you know, and you could see the Lord working in his life through that. 
but we see that the expansion of the gospel needs a spirit-filled testimony. Uh, how many individuals have we seen come to the Lord uh, because of a testimony? So just something to, to think about, even as we're handling conflict, right? That, that we don't, I, one thing I've learned in my marriage is that I don't want to neglect how my wife is feeling, even if she's wrong in a sense, right? That like her thoughts and how she's processing things, I need to, to consider. And we see that that's exactly what Peter is kind of doing, right? Like he's pouring out his heart here and, and giving his testimony before the apostles and the elders. The next we have in verse 12. So we went from Peter to now we go to Paul and Barnabas. And we see that the expansion of the gospel needs spirit-filled work. And that's what exactly how Paul and Barnabas response. Now, they don't say anything, right? We just see that all the assembly fell silent. Now, this is where some people would argue, I just want to throw this in there, that, well, he says, and all the assembly fell silent. It Doesn't that mean that the whole church was there? Well, I would say that word for assembly is just a gathering, right? So it's not so much as, as we use it in our terminology, like, hey, we're, we're an assembly here. We're all gathering together when we think of the assembly coming together, so to speak. But I, I would say that he's just saying, this is a gathering uh, of the apostles and the yellow. And they're saying, they all fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So Luke highlights a couple of things for us here. Among the Gentiles. And as Paul and Barnabas were probably referring there, and, and Luke doesn't need to quote them. Why? Because, well, we just read Acts 13 and 14. We probably saw some of the signs and wonders, and we saw some of the things uh, that they were doing. But Luke also highlights that phrase, signs and wonders. Uh, if we see that Jesus did many signs and wonder, wonders in Acts chapter 2, when, when uh, Peter is, is kind of giving his speech there, and we see that the apostles did many signs and wonders, and now we see that among the Gentiles, signs and wonders. And so what do signs and wonders do for Luke? Well, they authenticate the message for Luke. If you go to uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 24, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And so we, we see this idea that when Jesus would authenticate his message with signs and wonders, we see that in the early church, in the book of Acts, signs and wonders would authenticate the message of the apostles. And so when we're seeing signs and wonders being done among the Gentiles, it's authenticating God's message to the Gentiles. And that's kind of where we see that the expansion of the gospel needs this spirit-filled work, these signs and wonders being done, being done among um, the Gentiles. And so when we're kind of looking at conflict, well, hey, what about the story that we read, right? Where like the church was growing through that service. And they're saying, we, we've been hearing some things. They're saying that they just want to switch the services. And it's like, you know, like, man, the Lord was working in the lives of, of individuals. Like the church was growing, but yet we shut it down because we didn't want to switch two services. You know, and I'm not saying that you have to change things in order to grow. That's not my point. But it's saying, are we, are we sensitive to where, man, the Lord is really working here. We see these individuals changing uh, and, and we see the spirit working here. And hey, this can be an opportunity for the expansion of the gospel. And now, finally, we have James' response. Uh, and we see that the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles was confirmed by Scripture. And so, of course, this is my, my favorite part. Like, yes, James, way to step up and, and, and get the Scripture in there. But he kind of gives this, this response, and uh, he makes, he, he quotes, uh, what I would say is Amos chapter nine, verses uh, 11 through 12, right? And he says, it, which says, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. And so we can go to, to Amos chapter nine, verses 11 through 12 and kind of see a similarity and we don't have to get into that discussion. What was he quoting or, uh, you know, there, there's some differences, but uh, ultimately what is James presenting to 
uh, the apostle and elders as a, a scriptural argument for the expansion of the gospel, the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. And he also says something, and this is where I think what Luke would want us to think about more is a, is a, is a theme of the Old Testament prophets rather than a specific portion of scripture. And so, of course, instead of quoting five different prophets, he just refers to one, right? So that, that's one uh, you know, suggestion, and I think that, that makes sense. But what is the theme? Well, we see the fallen booth of David or the fallen tent of David. Now, it's not the temple, right? Because David didn't build the temple, uh, Solomon did. And so, well, what is he referring to when he's talking about the fallen booth or the falling tent of David. Well, we, we know from scripture that, that David was promised, right, that his house will be established forever. And so it's kind of like this, this unconditional, everlasting covenant that God made with David that his house would be established forever. And when you go through and you, you kind of read through the prophets, you see them establishing the throne of David, right? That the Messiah would come through the lineage of David. And if you go and you read like Isaiah chapter 11, you even see that Isaiah reworks it, right? And he's like, it's not gonna be through one of the, the kings that are currently, it's like, it, we're gonna go back to the stump of Jesse and a branch off of Jesse through David. That's where the Messiah will come. That's, it's almost like it's gonna be like this, this fresh start through the lineage of David. And that's kind of what the people of Israel were anticipating. We want the Messiah to come. And he's going to establish the new covenant. And I think this kind of ties back into what, what Peter was saying. Because Peter's saying like, man, the law was a yoke and we couldn't even keep up with it. Because when you go and you read through the prophets, you see that, that the people of Israel would continuously remain unfaithful to the Lord and would be disobedient. And it's to the point where, if you don't know your Old Testament, it's okay, but like we're just going to try to work through it, that the Lord brought them into captivity, right? So the Lord brings them into captivity because of their unfaithfulness. And then what happens is the nations mock the people of Israel. They're like, hey, Israel, where's your God at? <laughs> Thought he was going to deliver you. Here you are under our control, under our power. And the Lord says, okay, that's not going to happen. And so what does he say? He says, I'm going to bring my people out of captivity and I'm going to give them new hearts. I'm going to put flesh on their dead hearts, so to speak. And so we kind of see that through Christ, right? Now that's in the gospels and, and we see that working. What James says is, hey, by the way, this is for the Gentiles as well, right? And if you go and you read through Isaiah and you get into like Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, we see that the Gentiles are coming to the Lord. Right? And so that's kind of James' argument. He's saying that like, hey, what Peter's talking about, what Paul and Barnabas are talking about, the prophets confirm this. The Gentiles would come and put their faith in the Messiah. And so that's kind of when, we, when we're looking at this from, hey, how, do, how are we handling conflict? Well, if we want to ex expand the gospel, we see that it needs to be confirmed by Scripture. You know, why, why are we doing what we're doing, right? Where is the, the scriptural support, right? And, and so we need to see that as conflict is being, you know, discussed or it, it's being put on the table, well, where does scripture come into play uh, within these disagreements? And James is saying, we didn't see anything about the Gentiles identifying and being circumcised and coming in and, and following the Mosaic law. We just see that the Gentiles will be made new just as we need to be made new, right? And that was Peter's point. It's like, we couldn't keep up with the law. We needed a new cleansing. Hey, so, so did the Gentiles. And so he also, James also talks about, well, hey, we're going to encourage the Gentiles to abstain from the things polluted by idols, sexual immorality, from what has been strangled and from blood, All right? And so, uh, this is, this is tough. I, I was kind of working through this because, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 8 talks a little bit about, you know, food that's offered to idols and whether or not people should eat it. And he kind of gives more liberty there. 
Whereas James is saying, hey, you know, maybe these things you should actually kind of observe. And so in all likelihood, this could just be a request to be faithful just to the one true God, right? To be moral in worship and to, to have sensitivity issues of unclean animals and eating strangled animals without draining the blood as it was written down in Leviticus uh, chapter 17 and chapter 18. So the, the limitations are probably to keep relations from becoming strained in the mixed community of Jews and Gentiles, um, as well as to warn about association with idolatry. Uh, so it's clear that James wanted to encourage the Gentiles to be sensitive to others' convictions. So even though the Jews, and even though there's no longer this requirement of the Mosaic law, James is saying, hey, be sensitive to those who hold to that. And so when we're thinking about conflict, and we, we can take a lesson from, from James and say, hey, let's be sensitive to that conviction that that person has. And I'm not going to go into specific details, um, but I'm sure many of us can think of, man, I wasn't sensitive to that. But I'll, I'll just share one is, for my, myself is that I love rap music. And so when I found Christian rap, thanks, Jim. Um, I don't know if I should call you out on that, but I, you know, when I found it and I, I, I would, I would pull up in my car as loud as I can be I would, out of a speaker that, yeah, I'm, I'm blasting this music. And, you know, I, I knew that it got under the skin of, of some people. And when I saw that, I turned it up even louder because <laughs> I had the liberty to do so. You know, no, I need to be sensitive. Hey, to my brothers and sisters, do I really need to be doing that? You know, is, is Christ most honored and glorified in that situation? So we see that it was through experience uh, and scripture that resulted in theological formation. And I, I don't think we need to go into the reading of the letter and the response to the letter. And my time is up. And so that means I'm not going to go into verses 36 through 41, which I wasn't even assigned. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, but I just want to encourage us right, that... Conflict will arise, but what's more important is the expansion of the gospel and how we need to resolve these conflict. Unresolved conflict will destroy a church, as we saw at the beginning. All right? So let's give thanks for those spirit-filled leaders, the spirit-filled testimony, and the spirit-filled work, and the spirit-filled scriptures that we have that we can use to resolve conflict so that the, the gospel will go to the nations uh, and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for your word. We thank you that it's, it's living, it's active, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that, um, that we can open it, that we can read it, and we have the freedom to do so. And, and Father, I just pray that uh, as, as we leave here, that we would be challenged, uh, we would be convicted to change and to be conformed into the image of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that as we leave, we will look more like him and that we would just impact the world around us. Father, we pray for uh, our, our study tonight that as we uh, go to some questions that we would continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.